But what the Chinese have done, they have relied primarily on coal, which produces about 80% of the generation, but they haven't stopped there. They are now building 25 nuclear plants, leading the world in the development of nuclear. Our company's got people on the ground watching the building uh, of those units, and we're learning from that. They have also become the number one manufacturer in the world of both solar as well as wind turbines, and they're deploying them there. I was just last week with the chairman of the state grid, and he gave a presentation on how they are developing uh, transmission lines that basically there's no loss of energy as you transport power over vast distances, which are so critical to moving power to where the load is in China. So they are on the march. They're leading the world in the deployment and investment in technologies. The majority of the demand for energy in the world is occurring in the nine OECD countries, the orange or red, depending on how you see it. And the vast bulk of that is in China and India. This may not seem news to a lot of people, but it is a shocking change. Last year was the first year where the non-OECD countries consume more energy than the OECD countries. In the future, that's going to increase quite significantly. But think about it from this perspective. The gap between demand and supply in countries such as China or India is going to be the driver of global prices in oil markets and increasingly gas markets. It has become in our interest to understand how China is going to satisfy its demand for oil and gas. It's become in our interest to understand what kind of policies they implement on their demand side management. So to put this all together in terms of a bigger picture, uh, energy really is and continues to be a critical element in the relations among uh, countries around the world. It's a critical element in the relationship between the United States and Asia. There has been a tendency to see it as a zero-sum game. There are people here in Washington and there are people in Beijing who have thought there is an inevitable rivalry and conflict between the United States and China over energy. And that's partly because there was a mindset that energy was scarce and therefore uh, either is yours or yours. But in fact, I think this was a fundamental mistake because uh, they didn't see the interdependence. Obviously, there are specific issues like the South China Sea, where there are a lot of tensions and a lot of sovereignty issues. But what strikes me, whether you're talking about the United States and China or Asia in general, the common interests that come as importers, as consumers, as people who are part of a growing global economy, and given the sheer depth of the economic relationship, between, uh, between the two regions. Moreover, I want to emphasize that I think that a geopolitical Im impact of this unconventional revolution that has not been well appreciated is that it does reduce the tension and stress in the relationship. It takes the edge off what people had thought would be an inevitable rivalry. Over the past two decades, strong international partnerships have helped to develop and make available liquefied natural gas, natural gas that has been supercooled, which facilitates that efficient transport on marine vessels. With innovations like this and new production from Australia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, and even America, trade in liquefied natural gas can bring new flexibility and enhanced energy security to Asia and the rest of the world. At the same time, new supplies of North American unconventional oil are already bringing new positive dynamics to the global oil trade. Let's bring this discussion back to Asia for a second. And, and here, I just want to reinforce a couple of things that were said earlier. One is the importance of the opportunity to, to use gas. And the supplies of the Asian market and access to gas, and this goes back to the question that was discussed earlier about the abundance of supply, but you have to integrate that issue with price. And countries are going to look at what is competitive and how do you look at a scenario in the Asian market where gas can begin to compete on a price basis with coal. And this is going to present some real challenges that include both the supplies that are in the market, the infrastructure that's in the market, and it is going to raise some regulatory issues that are going to have to be addressed.